Amen. John chapter 3. Now, as you came in, you probably noticed on the sign out front, did anybody notice what it say? What it say? Somebody. Make a born again. How, let's try that again. Make America, Make America born again. Make America born again. And that's the title of my sermon this morning is Make America Born Again. And I'm going to look at John 3 for our key text here. If you look at it, it says in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, when I say make America born again, obviously you know that I'm playing off of that rallying cry, uh, make America great again, uh, a great political slogan. I mean, the political slogans are only worth so much. And I do believe that America should be born again. And the only way to, to make it great again is to make it born again. America was founded on religious liberty. And we've gotten so far from the religious part that we've lost Jesus. And we're interested in freedom, but not the Bible. We're interested in doing whatever we want, but we're not interested in going to church, reading the Bible, singing the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. America is in trouble, if you haven't noticed. And that's why a political slogan like, Make America Great Again, resonates with a lot of people. Because they're like, yeah, man, here lately it's gotten weird and things are getting worse. And I don't know what to make of the ins and outs of all this, uh, the politics, which of course, Polly is multiple and ticks is a bloodsucker. So, and this isn't a political sermon. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for or that kind of thing because uh, I, I always vote my conscience. I only vote for the Christian, which doesn't leave me a lot of options. You know, unfortunately, every year it's kind of like we, the, the Republicans, the conservative side, they get all rallied up and they're like, if we don't vote for uh, a Lucifer, then the devil might make it in. And that's kind of how it is. There's always something wrong with somebody, and I'm not here to critique political candidates in particular. But I am going to borrow from some of that energy that there's a lot of people that want to see America great again, and I'll tell you how to resolve it. It's by what this said right here, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. This is one of the phrases that's attacked in a lot of the modern Bible versions. They delete this for a reason. We are born again. We're regenerated. We're begotten again. Uh, there's a lot of words the Bible uses to give this description of our spiritual new birth. That old man is still with you. You're in the flesh. But now we have a new man because God's Holy Spirit comes and moves inside of you. And that's one of the great things that uh, made America great is the people that believed in Jesus and wanted to live for Him and raise their children for Him. That really is what made America great. If America is going to see any success or God's blessing anymore, we're going to have to focus on making America born again. Returning to the first principles, right? The, the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel, even a child can believe it, it is uh, the true source of all freedom and liberty. Because I tell you, God has blessed America greatly, and we do want His blessing back on our country. When you read through your Bible, if you're reading through on your, on your schedule, you've read through the Old Testament, the Kings and the Chronicles and Samuel and some of that. Well, you see some kings that come in, and even in the Judges you would see it. You see these Old Testament prophets, or an Old Testament king that comes in and they clean house. They get rid of the weirdos and they start securing things again and making it safe for children and families and God's people and esteeming God's Word greater than many of the other things that had been going on. And that's kind of what we need. We need that in America to make it great again. We need God's people to make His Word of high importance. We need to make this our priority. We need to make this what we talk about, not just football. Uh, there's a church not far from here. It used to be a Southern Baptist church. Some of you know what I'm talking about. They painted the outside gray and the inside black. And they dropped the word church and they dropped the word Baptist and everything else. And it's a, a single word. And you don't know if it's like, is it a health food store? Is it a bar? Is it a church? I mean, some of these funny names they come up with for these uh, liberal newfound churches. And uh, I met a guy I was talking to this week, and he's like, oh, yeah, I, I never really cared about God, but I drove by that place. And there were people out there holding signs just saying, I love you and come to church or whatever, whatever signs they said. And, and he said, and I just thought that was really neat. And so now I'm one of those sign guys. And I asked him about going to heaven. 
And he was convinced that he could lose his salvation because he sinned on a regular basis. And I say, what kind of a church is this? How do you make uh, God's people great when you're telling them a lie about the gospel when you're saying just keep repenting of your sins and you, know, you can lose your salvation? I mean, it's bad news when the churches of today are teaching the doctrine of Balaam when they're teaching a liberal, watered-down gospel, they're teaching a false gospel that you can be good enough to earn your salvation. That won't make anybody great. That's just going to put this big boulder on your back of a burden. Here, do the impossible. Oh, man. What do I have to do to go to heaven? Stop sinning and only think good thoughts and never get angry and never have any bad words. You're going to say, oh, boy, no one can be saved. Thank God salvation is easy. John chapter 3, Jesus tells us how to be saved. He says, believe, believe. Uh, Ephesians 2 tells us we're saved through faith. Not of our works. Not by being good. Not by turning from sin. That's why God gets us saved, to give us the Holy Spirit to help us figure that part of life out. So I want to talk this morning about how to make our nation great through the Bible. It's through preaching the gospel. Uh, we need to make America born again. And we all play a part in it. We do. And you say, well, I, Brother Fannin, I can't go out and knock doors like some of you young guys. That's okay. You still play a part in this process. You pray for our soul winners. You, uh, you encourage them. And we all work together. The church is uh, a very uniquely put together body of different body parts. Because I'll tell you, not every one of my body parts can work a hammer. My knee can't work a hammer alone. God gave me one body part that's good for a hammer. And so you're made as part of the body of Christ for the goal of producing fruit that would remain, that would come up and bear seeds and help others be born again also. You know, to make America great, I, I want you to think about this. In Jesus, in John 14, he told his disciples, if you believe on me, he says, uh, you will do greater works than these. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator, talking to average men, saying, if you believe on me, you will do greater works. Obviously, Jesus is the best. No one could outdo Him. But, you know, He only served for three years. And He's given us an entire lifetime to do more and greater works. God's will is we'd make America great again by making her born again by preaching the gospel. If you would, go to John chapter 1. Flip back for me if you would. John chapter 1. Um, true greatness is by increasing our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what pleases God. Uh, I want to take this phrase and break it down for you. Make America born again. Make that sounds kind of mean. Well, I, I believe in what's called confrontational soul winning. I don't want to be mean about it. But we are told in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The Lord will judge every soul. And those that have not trusted in Christ will go to hell. And because of how terrible hell is, we persuade men. We're told to compel them and encourage them. We're told to preach to them and exhort them. There's all sorts of words used, and I don't think saying make is out of place by any means. He says to go and make disciples, and that's what we're trying to do. I want to make our area here saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And to make something, it takes some action, doesn't it? That's kind of an active word. If I came into the kitchen and my wife's whipping up about what are you making is a fair question, isn't it? I mean, when somebody's creating something, they're making something that takes work. And God wants you, now that you're saved, to make disciples, to make converts, to make people born again. Now, make America born again. You think about that. Make America born again. Well, that's that's quite a bold statement there. I'm, I'm going to convert the country single-handed. Well, I kind of doubt that. But here's what I do know. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus made it very clear. He says that we shall be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea 
and all of Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's kind of like saying uh, in your neighborhood and then in your city and then in your state, then in your country and ultimately to the whole world. That's God's will for the gospel and many people did fulfill that. They would come out of a local church and go to another country and start another local church that would repeat that process. That happened with the early disciples and um, I believe that uh, here at home is where missions start. I am a missionary to the English-speaking people of Jacksonville, Florida, uh, here, especially here in this White House, Halsema area. I'm here to preach the gospel to the people in my community first. We take the responsibility for our road and our neighborhood first. That's where it begins. If we're going to make America born again, we have to take that burden on ourselves. Most of Christianity has lost that vision, frankly. We ran, into, I ran, we ran into a preacher one time out so winning, and he was talking about how his church gives away bread to the poor because that's what Jesus did after all. And he called that preaching the gospel. Now, wait a minute. Will that get anybody saved to give them a loaf of bread? No, I mean, maybe it's a conversation starter, maybe it's a door opener, but the only thing that can save a soul is by preaching the gospel and telling somebody what Jesus has done for them. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, I don't want to just give you a gift of a free loaf of bread. I want to give you the gift of everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. Your ticket to heaven because Jesus paid for it all. He paid for every one of your sins. Do you believe that? If you do, you're born again. The Holy Spirit has moved inside of you. Born again. You know, politicians these days, they'll wave the flag of religion. Politicians don't have a problem saying God, do they? No. But they won't say Jesus. You notice there's a difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They'll say God all day long. Just like most Christians, they'll quote a Bible verse, or they'll say the word Bible, but they won't reference the King James Bible that's not missing any. You know, all the other Bibles delete at least 16 or 17 uh, verses, and literally 64,000 words are deleted from some of these Bibles. I mean, they've literally changed it and manipulated it. They might as well call it the Swiss cheese Bible because the word God is missing, and hell is missing, and heaven is missing, and Lucifer, and Godhead, and New Testament, and Calvary. I mean, some very important doctrines are missing from a lot of the new Bibles, and people will say they believe in the Bible, and they'll call themselves a Christian, and they'll say the name God. But very few in the political realm anymore will just say it like it is. Hey, Jesus saves. Let me see a guy running for mayor saying that. I'll get behind that. Boy, I'll help him. I'll say, amen. That's a message that resonates with people. That can help everyone. Born again. Make America born again. Let's talk about this phrase, born again, according to the Scriptures. Now, you're in John chapter 1. If you would, find verse number 12. John 1 Verse 12, but as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we're saved by receiving his testimony, by believing in Jesus. Verse 13, which were born. It's introduced right here in John chapter 1. They were born. Now they were already alive but they had to get born spiritually because they were already born physically. He says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God said, hey, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. We're born again by believing on Jesus. That's what it means to be born again. If you would, go back to John 3. Uh, a couple years ago, I had this lady that uh, was talking to me, and she was raised Catholic, but now she, had, she took on the title. She said, I'm a yogi. She was a specialist in Eastern meditation, and uh, she was a very troubled individual. Uh, but she, after talking for a few minutes, she just stopped. She goes, you're not one of those born-again types, are you? 
And they said, well, yes, ma'am, I am. I am a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. In fact, I'm a step farther than that. I'm a Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist, not one of the Southern Baptists that have a Southern Baptist pope. We're independent. We believe in the local church. We believe that Jesus is the head of the local church. Whatever this says to do, we ought to do. And, you know, this is our authority. And if we, and if we start doing something that contradicts this, shame on us. We need to fix it and get back right with the Bible. Well, she didn't like that. It shook her. Oh, 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 we're born again type, huh? That's an attack. That's a phrase that's under attack. And I want you to embrace it. I want you to not be ashamed of being called born again, a phrase that we see in the Scriptures that Jesus said. Now, you know, in 1 Peter, he says in 1 Peter 1, 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, it says, hath begotten us again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why do I have hope past the grave? Because I'm born again, because He fulfilled it all. He was the first begotten from the dead. I have a lively hope. I look forward to living forever because of what Jesus did in His resurrection. In that same chapter, verse 23, it says, "...being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever." So, I am born again because of the resurrection of Jesus. I am born again because I heard the testimony that came out of the Word of God. So, uh, America cannot be born again if they don't want to hear the Bible. It's already happened in Canada, and it's, it's happening now in America, where they want to take your Bible and say, well, you can't read this or that. That's illegal. You're not allowed to read certain passages. You understand there are certain countries like Israel where you're not allowed to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can arrest you and lock you up for two years. That's horrible. Thank God we live in a free country. And you know, the sad part of it is, is, you know, I've mentioned this as we talked about the preservation of the Bible, we kind of have a book problem. Uh, I gave an example. Um, I uh, ordered a book on the internet, on Amazon, and it was printed the very next day in Orlando, and the following day it was on my doorstep. This has happened two or three times now. I open up the book, and right there it says, printed in Orlando on, and then the date was like two days ago. I'm like, Wow. Technology has gotten so great that they, they just have a digital copy. I don't have to buy thousands of copies of a book and then I have to put it in the mail to you. No, no, it's all digital. And they just push a button and the robot prints it and cuts it and labels it and ships it to you. And the robot makes sure it gets to my door and all of a sudden I have a book in two days. You know how long, you know back when some of our first printed Bibles, it literally took two years just to make dozens and dozens of copies because it was like stamping a page at a time and then you get the net and you stamp that same page again and you have to let it dry. We have a book problem. We've allowed technology to deceive us. You know, I make bumper stickers and if you want one of these, they're absolutely free. We've got some bumper stickers back there. Um, uh, you know, I mean, these came in a week. Boy, I can just print whatever I want as quick as I want. Uh, make America Born Again. That's a great idea. I'll make a bumper sticker. Hey, I'll write a book and I'll just print it off. Now, everybody, just about everybody, I would imagine on this road, has at least one Bible in their house. Raise your hand if you have more than one Bible in your house. More than one Bible. Everybody. You got more than one Bible. We have a book problem. We don't respect the Word of God as we ought to. We're distracted by technology. We'd rather watch something that has nothing to do with God than to humble ourselves and get down and read the Word of God. There's such power in the Word of God. We're born again by the incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This will always exist until the last day. God's not going to let it be destroyed. That's His promise. Now, you're in John 3. I want to look at a few verses here, and we'll be brief this morning, Lord willing. I say that every now and then, and I forget and, and, and go extra innings. But I promise, I'm going to try my best to be brief. I just want to show you from John 3 what the Bible says about being born again. I want you to understand this phrase and defend this phrase and understand why God wants you to have a spiritual new birth. Uh, starting in verse number 1, he says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, Nicodemus is mentioned three times in the Bible. And here's what's interesting, right? Make America born again. That's our phrase for today. But, you know, the political phrase is make America great again. 
You know, politicians will use God's name when it's convenient. This guy was a religious scholar, he was a Pharisee, and he was a political ruler. He was a political leader. He came to God looking for wisdom. He came with questions that he could not resolve. This is a political concept. Look at verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi. Now what does rabbi mean? Who can help me? Teacher. Master. master. Yeah, master. Teacher is very close, but master is the true interpretation. John 1 tells us that specifically. He called him rabbi, which being interpreted is master. So this leader. Now imagine if the mayor came to you at night, kind of snuck to your house. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, it's the well, come on in. And he says, Master, tell me this, right? Because Jesus held no title on earth. He would have been an average guy. Obviously, God was with him, and that's what he's saying here. So this political leader of great stature, and he had great spiritual understanding per se because he was a Pharisee, comes and he calls Jesus the Master. He says, Master, he calls him Rabbi. He says, We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And I want you to learn something about Jesus as we read these next few verses. Um, Jesus, oftentimes, when they would ask him a question, he would answer with a question. Or when they would ask him a question, he would use their own words to help them see the answer. Or he would, they would ask a question, he would answer with a parable, which is a spiritual story to give us understanding. Jesus was very wise, and we're going to see this pattern right here. And it would do us well to learn that. Sometimes we just want to answer quickly, but it's, sometimes it's better to ask more questions when you're confronted with a question. So he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Well, of course, Matthew says, he's Emmanuel, which is God with us. So uh, Jesus is the God-man, right? He, uh, but notice he says, except, he uses this except word. Now watch Jesus mirror his words. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this political ruler comes and he starts, boy, he starts laying it on, hey, you're the master and God is with you. And but I, I think even before he got to his question, because Jesus knows all men and he knows their hearts and he knows their needs, which starts with salvation, Jesus gives him one of the best salvation verses, except a man be born again, you don't go to heaven. If you're not born again this morning, you will not go to heaven with God. There is eternal torment for our sins. Thank God He paid for our sins, but it's up to us. So, he said, so Nicodemus said, except Jesus uses the same word back to him. Look at verse 4. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You ever heard the phrase, some people are too smart for their own good? Like, hold on, how's this going to look like? What are the logistics of that? How am I going to do that? I'm, I was a little baby, now I'm really big. I can't be born again. Or i got to go all over and get born like, like I was originally. No, 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 you're missing it. It's a spiritual application. He says, can he enter the second time into a womb? You catch that phrase? He's saying, can you enter the womb? Verse 5, look what Jesus says. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He says, I'm not talking about entering the womb again. I'm talking about entering heaven. You were born of the water when your mother's water broke. And now you must be born of the Spirit by believing on the Messiah. This is what he's teaching. Look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. When you get saved, God's Spirit moves inside of you. Notice it has capital S. The Spirit is, is Spirit. He's going to help you to be born again. You become a new man. 
because God's Spirit is indwelling you. He's inside of you to lead you and guide you into the truth. God's will for every man is that he would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. And of course, when I say man, I do mean mankind. I'm not omitting the ladies. Every lady must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust that He paid for their sins. And God's Holy Spirit will come and move inside of you. This is God's promise. Notice, the Bible is the only book that promises God dwelling with us. Every other book, religious book, says if you're good enough, then you might make it to heaven. And if you're bad, well, then we'll see when you get there. The Bible is the only book that promises you by trusting God, He will live inside of you and that other people can see God through you when God works and speaks through you. Now, this is why He gives us the Word of God. He gives us the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Spirit so that we can tell others to believe on Him. This is very important. Jesus is telling this to Nicodemus. Look what He says. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. He said, it's not an amazing thing. I'm trying to tell you how to go to heaven here if you would only listen. Verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. If a great gust of wind, it's like, whoosh, whoosh, and you're like, where, where it came from there, but where did it really come from? You know, South Africa, for all we know. Where is it going? Canada. We don't know, right? Well, that's kind of the Holy Spirit. You can't discern spiritual things, but you know it's there and you feel its power. These are those that are born of the Spirit. You understand that God speaks through His people with His Spirit, and if you'll trust Him, His Spirit will come inside of you. That's being born again. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? He's like, wait a minute, how does this work? Right? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? When Jesus said, you're, you're the rabbi, same word, you're the master and you don't know this? Wait, you're the great teacher and you're a political ruler and you don't understand that salvation's by faith? Why? Because he's bringing his works. He's trusting in himself. He's trying to earn his way to heaven by being a good person. And inevitably, you know what happens with people that believe that false gospel? They realize that they're sinful in nature, the human fleshly nature, and they feel like because I always fall short, I guess I'll just never be saved. Maybe one day I'll be able to get my stuff together and then I'll really live for God and then maybe He'll accept me when I die. That is discouraging. That is not the gospel. That's somebody trying to earn their way into God's favor and grace. And God said, no, no, no. The gift of God is eternal life. It's totally free. It's a gift. All you have to do is believe it and take it. Hey, I'm giving away stickers. Who, who wants one? Is there anybody that wants one of these stickers? Come get it. I don't believe you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Whichever one hobbles here first gets it. All right. <laughs> Uh-oh. All right. All right. I believe them that they believed me that I'm giving away a gift. Now, wait a minute. Come back here. I'm going to need $2. Well, you say, that's not a gift. Hey, I need you to clean up your life and promise you're going to come to church and you better be a good person and read your Bible. That's not a gift either. Salvation is through faith. They had enough faith to get up and come get it. God is offering you the gift of salvation and forgiveness of sins, and most people in America don't believe it. They think they have to earn it. I need you to come mow my lawn for that bumper sticker. And I got a big lawn now. That's a lot of work. That's not free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I will if you want me to. That would be a gift if you did, but I don't need you to. <laughs> hey, praise the Lord for, uh, uh, I just want to give you this understanding that God loves us so much. He made it free. He made it easy. Jesus is communing, communicating this to Nicodemus, who he's thinking way up here. Like this guy could probably quote Old Testament books of the Bible. In theory, being a Pharisee, he may have even been a scribe where he's actually written out handwritten copies of his own scriptures that he had, that he penned down as he copied the Word of God. He's got it all figured out. He's way up here. And God's like, no, no, no. I want to make this real simple like a child. Believe on me. 
Amen. Receive the promise. Take the gift. How can these things be? He says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. He's telling you, look, we as people, I tell you what I did, I tell you what I saw, I tell you what I know. Isn't that what we do? We're an eyewitness testimony. Uh, Brother Luke gave us an eyewitness testimony, wherever he's hiding, about a wreck he saw yesterday, right? And somebody almost died, and you're able to pray for the situation and try to help and be a blessing. He was speaking of what he knows, and he was telling us of what he saw. And Jesus is trying to bring it back, and he says, now listen to this. This is what we do. We testify of what we know. That's what Jesus did. He came down and told us of heavenly things, of salvation by faith. That's what his disciples were doing. Uh, he said, but you receive not my witness. Verse 11. Verse 12. If I told you earthly things, and you believed not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? When he says you must be born again, this is a heavenly thing. This is born of His Holy Spirit by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I go to heaven? Believe on Jesus. Sounds too easy. Well, it's a fact. Do you believe it? I think it should be harder than that. Don't go down that path. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never accomplish your own standard. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man, look at verse 13, this is important, this should be underlined in your Bible. Uh, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Uh, by the way, this is deleted from all the modern Bibles. Jesus is standing there in the flesh with them and he says, nobody in their body has gone up to heaven except me because I came down from heaven. I can go up and I can go down because I'm the Son of Man. Jesus is pointing to His flesh, saying, I came from heaven. He's showing His deity. Yeah, I'm the Son of Man. That's what the prophecy said. A Son of Man shall come, but He will be the Son of God. That was Jesus. And He said, which is in heaven. Do you see those last four words? The NIV, the ESV, the NLT, the ESB, the RSV, the NASB, they all delete it. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, talking to Nicodemus, saying, I am in heaven. Nicodemus was probably a little shaken at this point, realizing this is truly the Messiah. He already confessed that God is with you. And he says, not only is God with me, Jesus is saying, I'm God. That's what he's claiming. How do I get saved? How do I get born again? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to believe that he's God. Look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You remember the story in the Old Testament, they were being bit by serpents and he made a serpent on a pole and lifted it up. Kind of a picture of the cross, that's what Jesus is saying, that Jesus would be lifted up for our sin, that's what the serpent represents. Jesus took the punishment of the snake, which was sin, he paid for it. Verse 15, that whosoever, that means anybody, believeth, that means trusts, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. How long does eternal life last for? That means you don't go to hell. You don't go to death and hell, the second death. No, no. His promise is if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be born again. You are born again and you're saved forever. That is good news. That's what gospel means. This is the best news. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in religion. Only believe in Jesus and you will never die. You will have spiritual vision for eternity. You'll understand things because God's Spirit will come inside of you and stay with you forever. Verse 16, of course, the most famous verse in the Bible, in the whole world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a simple promise. For God, look at verse 17, for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Now God wants to use you to do the same thing. Not to go out and condemn people. Well, you don't look like me, and you're not as good of a Christian as me, and oh, they got problems, but not me. No, no, no. That's condemnation. 
We believe on Him. There is no condemnation. Now listen, I'm not saying live like hell, but I'm here to tell you, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and let Him work through you. You help people and you love people as Jesus Christ did. And you tell them how to be saved. You tell them how to live for Christ. You tell them to read the Bible. He didn't come to condemn the world. Why? Because we're already condemned in our sins. He came that they might be born again. What's it say? That they might be saved. Make America saved. That's what it means. Make America saved. Get Jacksonville saved. Get your neighbors saved. Get your family born again, born of the Spirit, that God would move in their life. But it's their choice. They have to hear the Gospel. Look at verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. That's Jesus. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. And he that cometh from heaven is above all. He's trying to tell us, listen, uh, people on earth talk about stuff on earth. Guys at work, right? Where they're going to talk about cars or football or money or computer games or something pointless, mindless fluff that means nothing in eternity. As Christians, what should we talk about? Well, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, His Word. New things we learn, prophecy. There's a lot in there if you haven't noticed. Now, I, I want to answer this one question and we'll be done. Why are we born again? Why does God want us to be born of the Spirit? Why does God want to give us of His Spirit, which is God, the Holy Spirit, to live inside of us? Why does God want to dwell with me? Obviously, there are many answers to the question. Here's another way to pose it. Why do we have the Holy Spirit once we're saved? Or what does the Holy Spirit do in your life? I mean, I can give you a hundred different answers. Let me give you two easy, simple points of why we have the Holy Spirit. God wants us to look more like Him. Look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Uh, people would rather be dark and do whatever they want. And that includes selfishness and pride and stinginess and all the other things, right? Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Think about it. The roaches don't like the light, do they? No, they scurry. Well, somebody that's sinning, they don't want to be confronted with the law, with the truth, with God. And they don't want a Holy Spirit-filled preacher coming to their door saying, hey, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? They're going to go, oh, I'm not, I don't want to hear that. This is a Saturday. It's my day off. Don't you know the Jags are playing? Leave me alone. Go away. I'm in the middle of having a party here. I don't want to hear that. Why? They don't want their works corrected. They don't want their deeds reproved. They don't want to be told that they're doing wrong. We go out and preach the gospel and it's like, hey man, you don't have to stop sinning to be saved because Jesus paid for every single sin. I just want to preach the gospel. And I've even had people say, I know it, but I'm just, I'm not ready. Yeah. Why? Well, I'm living with, my, I'm shacking up with my girlfriend. That's fornication. And I get high and drunk and that's not being sober. And I don't read my Bible and I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that life. And people will choose sin over salvation. Why? Because they love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. So what should we do now that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us? Well, we should go toward the light. Why? So our deeds can be reproved. This is a big mirror. It's literally called like a mirror. And he's got a big light over the mirror. And you start getting closer and it's like, ooh, ooh. Is that always? Ooh, wow. Oh, man, I'm getting old and ugly. And uh, Have I always had this problem? Why didn't you tell me I was this ugly, right? I mean, when we start looking in the mirror, we find problems, and the light shines that, and we see it. That's kind of what the Bible does to us. Well, that's one of the reasons we have the Holy Spirit. You are born again. You're born of the Spirit so that you can reprove your deeds, as he says right there in uh, verse 20. What's another reason? Well, look at verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist had the right attitude. John the Baptist had gotten popular. 
And he says, it's time for me to get off the scene because Christ is here. I had one purpose in life on this earth, and that's to point people to Christ, and I just have to decrease and go away, and I want you to see Christ. Well, that's our purpose here too, is to testify of Him, to look more like Him. I want to tell you how smart I am and what I've got together. Let me tell you my big old plans. Forget that. Tell them about Jesus. We must decrease. Human nature is, we want people to think better of us. Well, I think better of Him. He wouldn't do all that. You know, in Hebrews it says there are things that should accompany salvation. We should look more like Him. We should let our old man decrease, and we should increase the new man in our spiritual walk. Look at verse 34. For He whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth him not the Spirit by measure unto him. This is speaking of Jesus. John the Baptist, the only preacher Jesus ever went to hear, it, he preached through the power of the Holy Spirit, is saying when God sends somebody, namely Jesus, His Spirit works through them. What's your purpose in life? To let the Holy Spirit win. Don't resist the Holy Ghost. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore God's drawing on your life. Obey. We should obey. And when you do, the Holy Spirit will speak through you. Go to John 14, and when we're done. The two things that I want you to understand why God wants us to be born again, He wants us to be born of the Spirit, is to correct our evil, if you will, reprove our deeds, but then also to testify of Him. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you ought to have great confidence in Christ. And listen, I know some of you are like, huh, I've tried preaching and I'm a little embarrassed and I'm just not a, friend, I'm not a people person. Some of you teenagers are still kind of growing into your own personality and you're like, I'm too embarrassed and I'm shy. That's okay, you stay shy, you be you, but I want you to know that you're going out with a message of how great God is, and your confidence is in Christ, not yourself. Therefore, you have no reason to be ashamed. You need to speak up with all boldness, and you need to let it be known. Tell them who Jesus is and what He did. There's power in letting the Holy Spirit speak through you. John 14, uh, look at verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye, do, ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Here's the pattern. Jesus spake of the Father. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us so we can speak about Jesus. We don't speak about ourselves. And the Holy Spirit doesn't speak about Himself. We speak about Jesus. Why? To glorify the Son. Verse 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Once you're born again, how long does the Holy Spirit stay with you? Forever. He'll abide with you forever. Look at verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He's dwelling inside of you. He's in you. That's where we get the phrase, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He says the world doesn't understand it. It's like when the wind comes by and they don't know where it came from or where it's going. But God is inside of you. You know where he's coming from and where he's going. You're born of the Spirit. You're born again. Now the Holy Spirit, that Spirit of truth, is inside of you forever. Go to chapter 15 and we're done. Go to the last two verses in chapter 15. John 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, He shall testify of me. 
You say, why does God want me born again? So you will testify of Jesus. Why is it God wants me to be born of the Spirit and have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? So you will testify of Jesus. How can we make America born again? If you will testify of Jesus. Amen. Will you take that challenge? Will you let the Holy Spirit work in your life? He says in verse 27, And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. You know what happened? His disciples did this. They bore witness. And now we, what do we do? We tell the same story. Hey, let me tell you, we're all found sinners. And if it wasn't for the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, He died for every sin for every person. But most people won't receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. Most of them are trying to earn it. And they'll never be born again that way. God's will is that we would help others get born again. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Lord, thank You for saving me. Lord, thank You for the simplicity of the Gospel. Lord, I pray that You would help us to see this challenge, that we are to get closer to You, to be filled with Your Spirit, so that we can preach to others. Lord, I pray that You would help us to open our mouth and share the Gospel with others for Your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.